former assemblyman, uh, uh, former assemblyman for New York State, Dove Heikend, and uh, Israel Bitan. Um, Dove and, and Israel have uh, often worked with ZOA. In fact, they were on the uh, ZOA slate uh, for the World Zionist <laughs> Congress election uh, uh, in uh, 2020, and you know, part of, part of our uh, large ZOA coalition. Uh, and we worked together with them and, and, you know, in many protests, we were out together when uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, were absent uh, at City Hall, uh, protesting the anti-Semitism in Brooklyn. We were there together with Dove and, and you know, Mort Klein and so on. And, you know, we're just so honored to have them today because uh, they have written an incredible book um, about anti-Semitism, a, a brief history of anti-Semitism, which unfortunately, you know, it's not so it's not so brief. It's a long and sad, very long and sad history. Uh, and I will um, let Dove and Israel take it from there. And um, you know, please, if you have questions, you know, when we reach the question and answer period, you're you're welcome to either put your questions in the chat or, as you know, you can raise your hand and um, ask your questions live. And and anyway, welcome everybody. Welcome, Doe. Welcome, Israel. And um, and I'll I'll let, I'll let you uh, move forward. Okay, is Israel with us? I'm here. Oh, great, great. Uh, look, I, I I'll just do a brief. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things uh, that I've said about this book <clears throat> from the very beginning, and <clears throat> sorry, Israel Baton you know, two years in the making, two full years of hard work. Uh, I tell people it's like no book that exists anywhere in the world. And it takes a little chutzpah to say that because we sure know there are a lot of books out there on Jewish history, et cetera, on anti-Semitism, but it is like no book that exists. And, uh, you know, especially with the feature uh, in this book, the visual part of it, where throughout the book, uh, you know, anti-Semitism going back to Greco-Roman uh, period, up until just a couple of months ago, literally a couple of months ago, the visual part where you can watch videos, approximately 70 videos of the things you're actually reading about. You can go back, a, you know, you, you use your phone, there's an app you put on your phone, and you watch the video from that period of time. Quite remarkable, quite remarkable. And uh, <clears throat> it's an amazing tool uh, uh, for everyone, uh, young people, Jew and non-Jew alike. Uh, you know, for those who are not going to read a hundred different books, literally, uh, to, to really become familiar with Jewish history uh, over, the, uh, over the thousands of years uh, and the history of Israel and so on and so forth. There's so much material out there. And, and I would recommend that everybody do a lot of reading. But for the time being, most people just want to get the simple version straightforward. And that's what this book does. It gives you an overview of anti-Semitism in a way that is easy for people to go through and get to understand the basic arguments. So I'll just give you one example. Uh, when it comes to the whole issue of the uh, uh, so-called Palestinians, the Arabs uh, uh, who lived in Palestine at the beginning of the 20th century, what's the story? Did, did, did we Jews kick anyone out of that land? Did we take something away from someone? What exactly is the story? Uh, going back to the uh, 20th century, the late 19th century, the 20th century, what exactly happened in 1948 with the refugees? What's the story? This is not a book from the political right or political left. This is a book of history. And, uh, you know, so again, it just gives you those tools. It makes it possible for young people and who are on their way to college and the challenges that Jewish kids have at universities, it gives you those basic tools for you to be able to proudly defend the position uh, of the Jewish people, the, the, uh, of Israel and so on and so forth. So I, I'll, I'll let Israel take over. Uh, uh, like I said, two years of a lot of hard work to put it together and produce something that the president of Israel uh, wrote a forward, uh, the former head of the ADL, Abe Foxman, and then you have uh, people like Ambassador Friedman and uh, Erdan, Ambassador Erdan, and Danny Danone, and others. 
It's a, a remarkable piece of work that I urge everyone to get their copy on Amazon. It'll be in bookstores very soon. Uh, a brief and visual history, uh, as Liz said, and it's always a pleasure to be with Liz. Liz is uh, one of those people that uh, is just there for the Jewish people always uh, uh, from uh, ZOA. So I'm delighted to be with you, uh, Liz, and get this opportunity to speak uh, uh, you. to your audience. But order the book. I guarantee you will not be disappointed that anything that I've just said about the book, you'll say, you didn't say enough. Thanks so much, Dov. Israel, are you, are you going to speak now? Yeah, sure. Well, I would just, uh, first of all, also say, uh, you know, thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh you know, present and speak with uh, the book club, um, and uh, I also have to say that it was uh, it was two years of of a lot of hard work and two years in the making. But it would not have even started, uh, nor would it have been completed uh, were it not for uh, Dove, who was uh, you know the central pillar behind it, making it possible, doing a book uh, of this size, and uh, you know the assets that are in here, images, uh, etc., licensing. There's a lot of hard cost in there, um, and it simply doesn't get done uh, alone. And it, it, you know, I don't know that in many other organizations um, where they have the budgets uh, for it, um, where such a project would get uh, readily uh, greenlit. And that's uh, that was the case as soon as uh, we saw uh, anti-Semitism skyrocketing in 2019. And um, we got active at that point as Americans Against Anti-Semitism and looking for ways to uh, make a difference in the space of anti-Semitism without duplicating efforts, without uh, uh, repeating what others are doing, and also doing things that we believe would really be effective towards some bottom line, not just things that make us feel good uh, about what we're doing in combating anti-Semitism. And the turning point came when uh, I think it was about a year into it, uh, early 2020, uh, before the pandemic hit, uh, Dove had spoken at, uh, doesn't make, make a difference which particular school, but I will say a modern Orthodox, uh, uh, I think it was a high school or, or a college uh, high school. Um, and um, he was shocked that these are kids that have a Jewish education and they have a background. They've certainly learned about the Holocaust and Zionism, um, but they were still lacking so much information about anti-Semitism. Um, and the light, the obvious light went off because uh, education as a response uh, to hate, uh, uh, you know, which is largely based on ignorance, is always the way. But what sort of education for who? Uh, we're not trying to educate anti-Semites to get them to, you know, stop believing that we have space lasers. Uh, that's futile. Um, the more important goal was recognizing and realizing that here we have, you know, the who are the ones that are on the front lines? Uh, probably in terms of hate crimes and absorbing it, you have Orthodox Jews and Hasidic Jews in New York City, and generally. Uh, it's going to be young Jews who are heading to our universities, uh, university campuses. That's the, the most front line there is where you have the forces uh, backed by state sponsors um, a, a, who are operating in a very uh, concentrated, uh, you know, a coordinated manner, the BDS on, on the campuses and, and making it uh, really a place that's inhospitable to uh, young Jews and their Jewish identity. So uh, that became uh, right away, a, a very clear opportunity uh, to do something uh, meaningful. And we looked around. The first step was not to assume that we should, you know, spend time and resources developing uh, a curriculum, a book. Uh, it was looking around. Well, what's out there? Um, and we found that what was out there was extremely uh, 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 not suited to the task. We're talking about very slim, you know, uh, pamphlets, uh, essentially, uh, you know, just text mostly, and basically universalizing anti-Semitism. So uh, to help Jews and non-Jews uh, take what they know about anti-Semitism and apply it to everything else. It's important. That's nice. But that's not the work. That's not what young Jews who themselves are whether they like it or not, being thrust onto the front lines need to hear, need to be uh, taught and guided through. Um, and that has a lot to do with my own experiences in encountering anti-Semitism from a very young age uh, at, you know, routinely that 
you know, where does it come from? You, you come up as a Jew, you didn't do anything to anybody. You're not part, you didn't get money bags, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the, at the local Jewish chapter. You don't have horns, you don't have a tail. Wh how do, you know, yet people, you know, left and right come at you and you have to wonder where does it come from? And it's very easy, unfortunately, especially on campuses, for young Jews to internalize that hatred, not know how to make sense of it, not know that it represents more of the haters' uh, internal issues than anything about the Jews. Um, so this was meant to, you know, put that in context and uh, really address this gap, this educational gap that existed. We have to realize that anti-Semitism as a category, uh, as a educational category, is relatively new. Uh, you, Holocaust is a whole educational enterprise, Zionism, um, and of course there are, there's anti-Semitism and anti uh, you know education within that, but not going all the way back. Uh, from the start, more than 2,000 years, and tracing it um, and connecting it with, uh, you know, through the contemporary period, through the creation of Israel, um, which obviously, as we know, the Israeli-Arab Israel, Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, has become the, uh, you know, hot button issue uh, that, that anti-Semites uh, anti are using against Jews. So uh, that was the goal. That was, you know, uh, how this was spurred. And um, uh, yeah, it would not have been possible without, you know, getting out there, being on the front lines, uh, as Dove and, and Liz mentioned, uh, you know, both Dove and Liz are very much uh, like that in terms of uh, being the first uh, to be out there, sometimes the only ones to be out there, sometimes when it's unpopular, um, and then still there, of course, when everyone else uh, decides to uh, to join, but it's, it's those efforts, it's that, uh, you know, uh, interfacing with those youth, recognizing the issue, looking around, and not waiting for others. That was another uh, goal as an organization, as a startup, upstart, you know, uh, was we have to do our part no matter what. We're not here to wait. You know, what can we do? If we don't have big funds. Well, what can we do with what we have? And using my background in design, layout, publishing, I had an ability to put together a book that would have cost probably three to five times as much to produce in uh, almost any other scenario. So it was a unique opportunity, um, and I'm thankful to uh, to have had it. It's uh, it's it's my life's work, uh, really, to uh, to do something uh, this meaningful that uh, that hopefully does resonate with people and that has, in effect, the bottom line, uh, mostly with uh, young Jews and young people in general. But it's also uh, written for uh, and made accessible to a broader audience. Well, thank you so much. Wanna, oh, go ahead, Doug. Oh, no, no, I was just going to mention the uh, place that uh, uh, Israel was referring to was, uh, you know, Yeshiva University, where I spoke to these amazing kids who are brilliant. We know that our Jewish kids, you know, love to study, love to learn and want to become doctors and lawyers and professionals. But the thing that I was, uh, you know, a little shocked by uh, was when we began to discuss certain things in Jewish history, the kids just did not know. You know, I was sitting at my Shabbos table talking about Soviet Jewry recently, and some of the people at the table had no idea what I was talking about. You know, yeah. like, what's Soviet Jewry? I know it was a long time ago, but it's a chapter in Jewish history, uh, uh, a difficult chapter, a chapter that I'm very proud of having been involved uh, in in that battle, uh, you know, through Rabbi Kahana of uh, Ashalom. So people don't know. Just recently, you know, a story with Seth Rogen, uh, you know, a comedian, a lot of people like him. You know, he, he really symbolizes, he made some comments very critical of Israel. And one of the things he said was he was critical of his parents, because his parents, when they were teaching him as he was growing up about Israel, Palestine, he loved Israel, uh, you know, went to Israel, uh, stayed in Israel. But he said that his parents never told him. They made it sound like when the Jews came to what was then Palestine, there was nobody there. The Jews, you know, just found an empty land. And Seth Rogen said, my parents never told me the truth. They never gave me the facts. And, you know we'll send Seth Rogen our book so he can get the facts, you know, but he was very upset that his parents did not tell him. They made it sound. They didn't, maybe his parents didn't know the facts actually. Uh, and, and, and the history is one that we can be proud of. 
we did not kick anyone out of their homes ever. You know, there's n there isn't a story in the 20th century regarding Palestine where Jews removed the people who were living there, Arabs, from their homes, took away their homes. That never happened. I've never read of a case like that. I've read of people purchasing a property in, at that time, Palestine. So it's so important for people to know the facts, to understand them, to absorb it, to be able to defend our position. Uh, because it's not very complicated to defend it, but you got to know the history. You got to know the facts. Uh, and there are no two set of facts about this. It's very, very clear. We can be very, very proud of our history. You know, begin, you know the, uh, the Zionist movement, Jews moving back to their homes, uh, you know, explaining it all. And, and, and this book spends a nice amount of time talking about that. Again, I just want to say to everybody, for those who don't like to read 700 page books without pictures or very few pictures, uh, this is a book that you will find very easy to go through. Uh, uh, it, it, and we call it a brief history. It's uh, about 550, 600 pages. But again, uh, it's meant for people to actually go through it and study. Those who want to know more, those who want to study, you know, there's a, a, a page or two about the Dreyfus affair, very important piece of Jewish history that people need to know about that turned uh, Theodor Herzl into a real Zionist, uh, uh, you know, reporting on what he was seeing at that time for an Austrian newspaper. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's so important, again, I mean, the bottom line is that if you want to know more about the Dreyfus affair, there are so many books written about it. Go do that. But meanwhile, this book gives you a the basic, basic facts. It's so important for Jews to be knowledgeable, for everyone to be knowledgeable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dove and Israel. You know, it, it's so, it, this is so true. And you know, one of the things that I found interesting that for, even for people who are very knowledgeable, there are like tidbits of information in here that, um, it, no matter how much you've studied, you know, you, you can learn something from um, the pictures are also <laughs> the anti-Semitic cartoons are really fascinating. Um, I have one issue with those, which is so for people who are older who are reading this, you know, maybe if you republish it, uh, you know, when you have your second and third printing, make the captions a little larger. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, th th those are, you know, it's really quite Quite fascinating, um, you know, in many areas. One, one, there are a couple of questions that I have, and, you know, then I welcome in anybody who would like to a ask your questions, raise your hand or, um, you know, or put your question into the chat. Um, one is that uh, at in the beginning of the book, you talk about how it's designed for people who are at least 16 years old because of, you know, some of the painful nature of um, anti-Semitism and, and the topics covered in the book. And I think as, you know, as parents and grandparents, I think we often wonder, you know, how to explain this to, to young children who, who are going to encounter this, who are, who encounter anti-Semitism. And as you were writing this, did you um, come up with, uh, did you have any thoughts about this? How, how to um, explain the, the whole issue to, to the really young people, the, you know, the, the elementary school kids who are, you know, who may confront this on the street or, you know, see, or see it around them and, and, you know, and, you know, are, who are so innocent and, and loving and believe in good in the world and, you know, and then they confront this hatred. Um, you know, I, I think that's, you know, one, one of the issues that, you know, that I think many of us struggle with and I would love to hear your thoughts, Israel and Dove, on that? Well, I think that, first of all, that's a great um, question, a very important question, and um, there are two parts. Well, first of all, I, I spoke uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago at a, a temple uh, in New Jersey to middle schoolers, um, about 50, 60 middle schoolers, their teachers, their parents, and uh, I created a, a presentation for them uh, based on the information of the book, um, but not at all showing, you know, the same images, um, something entirely different that was uh, going to be suitable, that was not going to be shocking, um, because 
you know, that that was not the setting. Um, and the emphasis, the message in terms of uh, that, that I used to convey a lot of the same information, the heaviness was very simply what we've all become very much experts now uh, with is vi the virus. And, you know, a lot of people have talked about anti-Semitism as a virus, but uh, in light of the pandemic, we can really, really, especially kids, uh, can understand so much about the dynamics, the, the raw ingredients of anti-Semitism, which, you know, operates exactly like a virus. So if you if you understand how, uh, you know, a pathology works, how uh, there are virological factors, there's an epidemiological potential um, for something to spread. Why do some viruses you know, become pandemics and some don't. Ebola was, uh, you know, one of those examples. It was scary and then it went away. Anti-Semitism is that global pandemic that started uh, over 2000 years ago and really spread out and hasn't gone away and, you know, dies down after the Holocaust. It, you know, like like certain uh, viruses, they don't disappear. They just hate hang, low, hang low until the right time. They mutate and they come back uh, with a certain force. So that, that, right there, I think, is a, is a universal way. It's a, it, between younger and older, everyone intuitively understands what's, what, what, what is involved in that and how something like anti-Semitism uh, can function along the same lines. In terms of the book um, and throughout the process, it was something I considered very much. Um, and that's why I put a warning in the book at the beginning um, where the suggested age is 16 plus less so for the contents um, than for the images, which if, you know, coming across them, uh, you know, uh, untrained without any context, uh, it can be shocking. I, I don't know. Uh, everyone's a little bit different. And of course, I, I do write in there that uh, it's up to educators and parents, our parents who say, well, I know my 13 year old, this is, you know, they're, they're mature enough. Great, you know, everyone has to know their own uh, child or student. But as a general, uh, you know, who is designed for and and who to, to speak to is is also uh, having a certain minimum maturity to absorb that information in a healthier, uh, productive way. So you know, there there, there is a time. Uh, and, and it's different in every school, uh, different types of schools. You know, when should the Holocaust be taught? There are some where it's not taught at all, uh, some where it's taught very early, some later, some very graphic, some uh, very sanitized. You know, that, that's a, a, a pedagogical uh, decision uh, for parents and educators. But because, uh, you know, myself in going through this and going through the archives, there, there are you know, five, 600 pages, there must be in some several uh, images per page. So you're talking about thousands of images in here. I went through thousands and thousands of images and documents uh, in the archive reading about, you know, a few hundred killed here, 20 killed here, you know, uh, seeing the images, seeing the bodies, seeing the bad images that I didn't include here. Um, so knowing that, knowing the impact, the power uh, was twofold. It was to tell me that I had to be careful uh, with what I put in there. It's not because, you know, the freedom to know any knowledge is good knowledge. It's like, not, not it's not. There has to be, the, the, the barometer was there had to be a real purpose in seeing that particular image, something to learn from that. The <clears throat> other side is because it's a virus and we need to understand it. The works on anti-Semitism until now are largely have been text-based. They missed out on connecting the dots between this, you know, trove of historical visual uh, anti-Semitism with the textual, the theoretical, the explanations about it. Um, so that was, again, another opportunity to, to bridge that gap, bring, bring those uh, pieces together uh, in, in one book. Yeah, I'll tell you, well, you know, when I was a kid growing up, my, my, my dad is, uh, escaped from uh, Germany in mid-38. So he was, you know, in Germany during, you know, a good part of the uh, early years of the Hitler era. And, and I remember him telling me about how the newspapers had these horrible images of Jews all the time. And, you know, and how that made him feel, you know, very, you know, kind of withdrawn and shy about, you know, and, and, uh, you know, how difficult it was to see that all the time. And I'll tell you, when I was looking at some of the images in the book, you know, I sort of really felt what he must have felt like, you know, seeing seeing those images. And you're, you're so right about the power of these images to make people understand 
you know, what Jews have been subjected to and, you know, and, and, and you know, to, to see what, you know, what our, you know, our ancestors and also, I mean, today, you know, yeah, you're showing the images from today, the, uh, you know, the Palestinian Arab uh, horrific images they have of Jews. And this, this is so important. Um, I also, you know, wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit about um, the medieval times, um, you know, which you discuss uh, some in the book. Um, you know, this this summer I was in Basel. Uh, Mort Klein was honored um, at the World Zionist Congress um, in the 125th anniversary of both ZOA and, and the World Zionist Congress. And, you know, while I was there, I learned a lot about the history of Basel. And in the 1300s, um, there was the Black Plague and they blamed the Jews and they took all the Jews and put them on an island and, and, and burned them, you know, the whole community and, and forcibly converted their kids. And I know that you, you talked about things like that, you know, in various communities in Europe. And I'm wondering if you could speak about that whole, you know, chapter in history, which was, was so horrific and, you know, which you, you touched on, which many people are, you know, again, it's one of the things that many people are not aware of. So, you know, to understand the medieval period, you, you know, and this is really the purpose of the book. And um, the reason why it's called brief is not really only tongue in cheek. Uh, it, it's actually because in going through the information, and you just mentioned an episode um, that I had, uh, you know, come across, but I've come across so many episodes that couldn't make its way into the book. There are so many examples. There are so many layers um, to it so that this is relatively brief because you can go through, like Dove said, uh, in each area. I mean, uh, you, you can spend, uh, read 10 books on Dreyfus to understand all the different angles that were involved um, just for that. So, uh, you know, it's brief on that end, but the point of it, and going back to the virus, we are, the goal is to understand where it came from, how it mutated, and why it takes on a certain shape um, with certain virological qualities, you know, uh, more deadly, less deadly, uh, more overt, less overt. You know, this goes back to the um, before medieval, before the uh, uh, rise of Christianity. It goes back to Haman and Purim and Hanukkah, which we just passed, which were uh, the two poles of anti-Semitism, really going back to uh, Amalek, that uh, coldness that's described of, of someone going out of their way to encounter a group that they don't know, they've never encountered, they would never encounter otherwise, but they've heard of them and they just don't like them. And they went all the way out of their way to smite the Jews. And we know what happened to them in the end. Um, and that set the paradigm. So you have uh, uh, Purim is the overt, genocidal, uh, intentional, uh, you know, it wants to destroy the Jew root and branch. And the other was the Greco-Roman who, you know, wanted to rescue us from our Judaism. It was out of their humanitarian concern. Um, and the ultimate, the, the end goal is always the same. So the medieval period, how did we get to such, you know, the poisoning of the wells, the pogroms, the expulsions, the inquisitions, uh, it really started, and this is a huge difference between the Greco-Roman type of uh, anti-Judaism that existed and what turned into Christian uh, anti-Semitism. And that really, unfortunately, uh, is what made anti-Semitism, I believe, what it is today, a, a global phenomenon, and for obvious reasons. Number one, uh, in the ancient world, it's it was unheard of where one religion emerged from another and in an antagonistic form. It didn't happen uh, in, you know, you can have all kinds of Buddhists, all kinds of Hindus. Uh, you had a different, uh, there are many, there are thousands and thousands of Hindu gods. Uh, Hinduism is not in uh, competition with Buddhism that it had to, uh, it's scripture address itself. This is unique in the annals of history. Judaism came along, not only claimed a God, a singular God, but said, and no other. Um, and that really uh, uh, had certain ramifications. And at the end of the day, Christianity comes along, says, hey, we're, the Old Testament, it's all good. Uh, the Jews, you had the covenant for a moment. Now we supersede it. Um, now, that's fine, like if you want it, wanted to believe that. But the issue at the time, <coughs> when this religion was first being created, uh, was that, well, how would you justify, why would you tell people, especially Jews at the time, they were trying to get Jewish Christians who were somewhere, you know, on the line, uh, trying to convince them to cross that line. Uh, how would you do that? You would have to say there's something wrong with the originator, with the progenitor, the, you know, join us. Or we're from them, but we're the next best thing. 
So to say you're the next best thing, you do. You also have to elevate yourself and put down where you came from. But that's a fraught relationship because if you come from that and you're putting it down, you still need it to exist because if it really disappeared, then where did you come from? So it that set the tone for a, a very uh, fraught and difficult uh, dynamic where, uh, you know, the early days, Jews were either barely tolerated as an example so that, uh, you know, the, the early church fathers could point and say, this is, you know, uh, the example of, of the uh, person who does not go according to, you know, Christian ways. Um, or, of course, they needed to be persecuted. They had to be rid of that. There are people who believe that the fact that Jews existed is what, you know, prevented their redemption, their Messiah to return. <laughs> Um, and bouncing back, back and forth uh, between those two uh, types of uh, approaches of bare tolerance to outright uh, uh, attempt uh, to, you know, uh, a, a genocide. The big turning point within Christianity and its relationship to Judaism, uh, of course, was Constantine and the uh, conversion of the Roman Empire and, you know, turning it into the uh, Byzantine Empire, because what that did is that it took something, a what was still relatively regional, localized grievances between an outgrowth group, um, you know, an intergroup uh, uh, type of uh, issue into, well, it, it spread a religion in a way that religions hadn't spread before. And suddenly it took issues that, like we just said, you had to have some kind of opinion about Judaism if you were becoming a good Christian. So you had no choice. Um, through it becoming a, an article of faith, it was, in, you know, institutionalized and, and became part of the doctrine that suddenly spread to millions of people across a great geographic expanse. Well, what, what would that do? That multiplies the number of people who would harbor anti-Jewish sentiments. Um, now, such a phenomenon is even more, uh, uh, you know, incredible when you consider that we're 16 million people, uh, 16, 17 million Jews in the world today, and they're over... Uh, by most estimates, three and a half goes to four billion uh, Christians and Muslims around the world that have come in, in a sense from Judaism, but have to have had at the outset, at least an antagonistic attitude towards Judaism. No other group, no other religious group has spawned such a, you know, outgrowth reality that then reflected back on it in this very, uh, uh, you know, uh, cruel, uh, we, we can say, cruel way over more than 2,000 years, uh, each in their own way and own time. And of course, to varying degrees in different times and places. It's not to paint a picture as if everything was always bad everywhere. That's not at all the case. Um, but the, the point was, is that whether it was in Muslim lands or in Christian lands uh, or, in, or in, you know, the Greco-Roman lands, uh, of, you know, Alexandria and places like that, uh, Jewish life was always precarious because it depended on, you know, the tolerance, the whims, uh, the, the compassion and empathy uh, of one, one ruler. And that was obviously very difficult uh, to follow up. So that really sets the stage. You have now a church, you have a, uh, 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 an institution powerful that was married with state. Um, and suddenly it's, uh, it, you know, uh, interest involved denigrating Jews, demonizing Jews. Jews took on all the worst qualities. We became the living embodiment of everything that they could claim could be wrong in the world and in humanity. It was the Jew. We were, you know, the quintessential scapegoat. Um, so that, again, has lasting power that builds a, you know, there's a whole repository. All of the anti-Semitic images that we have today originate in that Christian uh, um, uh, theological anti-Jewish thought. The horns, the, uh, the tail, um, you know, the, 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 and then of course, at the same time, the conspiracies, the myths, the, the stereotypes that they played on, they did not originate in the Christian world. This is what people really need to understand is that that goes back uh, to the Greco uh, uh, context where uh, such libels as, um, you know, that Jews would fatten the Greek uh, at a certain time every year, they would capture him, they would fatten them up in the temple by feeding them sumptuous foods, and then at a certain time, uh, they would sacrifice that Gentile, and they would partake in eating their flesh and drinking their blood, at which point, ironically, someone knew this uh, bit of information, they would exclaim their hatred for humanity because they were misanthropes. Okay, Leaving aside how you know peculiar that is, 
Um, but this is a uh, an I real idea that was prevailing uh, going back, uh, you know, more than 2,400 years. It's in uh, many different uh, of leading uh, Greek and, and Roman authors. Um, so such ideas did not originate in the Christian world, but they took them and developed them further. So they gave it a theological resonance. Uh, the Greeks and Romans in their society, you were not virtuous if you hated Jews. Uh, the government didn't necessarily, you didn't have to, it, you know, certainly for Antiochus maybe in his court, uh, it, it helped. But for the most part in society, it wasn't an article of faith. It wasn't like you're Greek, of course you hate Jews. But if you were Christian, of course, you had to have a bad opinion about Jews. Otherwise, well, why did you join the Christians and not the Jews? So uh, that set the tone. Um, but it did take several hundred years until things really started developing to the point where you had uh, the expulsions, the pogroms, which started uh, really, you know, 10th, 11th, 12th century, uh, where you started to have expulsions from France, from uh, England in 1244, I believe, uh, uh, after uh, we had the story there with uh, William of Norwich, little U of Lincoln. Uh, again, these blood libels, uh, little children went missing, blamed the Jews. <clears throat> Uh, it was used as a pretext to launch violence, used as a pretext to uh, expel and, and uh, ransack, take, uh, uh, you know, uh, the goods of Jews. Um, and you get to the the uh, heart of it, of course, with the Crusades starting in the uh, early 11th century, um, which, again, has to do with other regional developments, which I also deal with from the other angle of the book, which is what is the history of the land of this uh, land alternatively called uh, Canaan, Israel, Judea, uh, uh, you know, Palestine, Ottoman Palestine, British Mandate, Israel. What what is the uh, you know the history according to the land? Not not what any group has been saying. What does the land actually tell us? And when you look at, as most people probably know, um, is certainly Jews who are are familiar with this. Uh, the land literally spits out you know archaeological gold. Um, uh, corroborating just so many different aspects of the biblical narrative. It doesn't matter if, you know, it's there, not there to verify, uh, uh, you know, every aspect of it, but it corroborates enough to tell us one thing uh, that's absolute is that there was a Jewish people. They were there. Everybody knew about it. Nobody uh, denied it. Nobody tried to make as if there wasn't a Jewish people for two and a half thousand years. They tried to kill Jewish people because they were there. But nobody had the, the temerity to say, well, the Jews actually don't exist. And uh, no, they have no connection to that land. It's it's a it's a new idea relatively, really, uh, the you know, the past century where for once, not only are Jews being killed, uh, but they're actually also uh, uh, you know, being lied about in terms of their their history, their connection. We're not we're we're not even the real Jews anymore. We were being murdered for being the real Jews and and uh, you know being uh, uh, stubborn and sticking to our our Judaism. Uh, you know, to any degree, as as Hitler showed, you you held on to it. Uh, you know, you had a, a small percentage of it. It was enough. And yet today, you have people who will look you in the face and say, "Hey, not only am I the real Jew, and I discovered it like last week or last month or last year, but you guys." You guys are the ones who have been like, you know, dying for it and identifying that way for generations. You're the fake ones. Think about how absurd, yet we can laugh it off. But Kanye West, his uh, follower account has been exploding because there are people where, oh, yeah, that sounds great. It actually, there's an audience for it. That's the danger. And there's an audience because only Judaism has spawned uh, uh, an antagonistic outgrowth. Uh, that have become, that have ballooned to, you know, f half the planet, basically, that to whatever degree had to have ha reckoned with, well, how do we feel about Jews? In Judaism, there is no, we don't need to reckon with what do Jews think about Christians and Muslims. In the scripture, well, it, that's irrelevant. It didn't, you know, you treat them like any other human being. People are good to you. Treat others the way you want to be treated. But as Jews and Christianity and Islam emerging from there, we have to recognize why uh, the landscape is as it is. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I mean, wanted to get, actually you sort of uh, touched on one of the questions that we have from uh, uh, who's, you know, somebody who's asking about the, the uh, black anti-Semitism after um, Jews did so much, um, you know, to help blacks during the civil rights era, especially, <laughs> you know, continue to. Um, and, uh, you know, it, to touch on, you know, to speak about that a little bit. I'll let Dove. Uh... 
Yeah, <clears throat> let me just, uh, you know, we are now living uh, in 2023 uh, with an outbreak of anti-Semitism like I've never seen in my life to the point where, you know, people ask me how much, how much time do we still have in America? I mean, people actually call me and ask me that question because they are so concerned with regard to what's going on. And there is every reason to be concerned. Uh, you know, four years ago, three years ago, things were bad. But right now, it's like you can't keep track of what's going on, the anti-Semitism. And it's not only in the United States. It's literally everywhere, in France, in England, in Belgium, on and on and on. <clears throat> I mean, you got anti-Semitism where there are no Jews. I mean, there are no Jews, but the Jews control the banks and the media and, and on and on and on. And that's why this book is so important. I mean, uh, what Israel was talking about uh, should make everyone's mouth water in terms of getting that knowledge, getting that information. Because when you study Jewish history, when you go back thousands of years ago and you recognize that nothing has changed, the things they said about Jews a couple of thousand years ago are the same things they're saying about us through history and right now in 2023. Think about it. But it's important for people to have that information to be able to go through, you know, what Israel briefly was going through throughout history. You know, anti-Semitism, you know, we always get asked the question, why? You know, why has there been a uh, this outbreak suddenly? What's going on? Why? And what can you do about it? Uh, it? These are very, very important questions. And, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, black anti-Semitism. You know, the report that was just done by Americans Against Anti-Semitism. You know, we've been living, you know, with the former mayor of New York and especially Democratic elected officials throughout the country. All they want to talk about is white supremacists, that they're responsible for all the hate that's going on out there. And there's no question that white supremacists are a very serious danger to the Jewish people. But here in New York, the, you know, you can hardly find a white supremacist, at least those who commit crimes against Jews. The report that we just did showed that literally uh, 90 plus percent of the hate crimes committed against the Jewish people were committed by other minorities and approximately 70 percent committed by people in the black community. Now, no one is blaming any community, but no one wants to talk about this reality. No one wants to deal with it and ask the questions. How do you solve a problem if you don't even want to face the problem? So, you know, reading this book, getting the information, becoming knowledgeable. Knowledge is power. And again, as I said, you're not going to become a historian by reading this book but it will give you the basics. It will give you the fundamentals. And you want to learn more, you can go on and study many, many other books. So, you know, we're very, very proud, uh, uh, yeah, you know. Right, rightfully so. Right, amazing right, yeah. what Israel right. Baton created. Right, right, definitely, rightfully so. Um, I, I'd like to... <laughs> I, I, I do want to answer. I do want to answer to your original question. Okay. Uh, I, see, I, I, I would I call on some of the guests. I would. I'd like to call on some of the, uh, you yeah. know, the people to also go ahead, please. Go no, ahead. It was. It was also, to, you know, specifically the way it was asked here in the Q and A. How do we confront those in the black community after all Jews did for civil rights that we are not your enemy? So I think that that question is, uh, you know, tricky. I, I don't think we have to confront. Um, you know. Uh, Part of what we've done, you know, with Dove, Dove has gone out, you know, hit the streets in Crown Heights um, to talk to people. I've the, when there was a spike in 2019, he wanted to understand for himself, like, where is this coming from? It has to be coming from somewhere. It's a, it's a, in the air, in the water, uh, something that's being, you know, people are drinking. What is it? And you go out on the street and people were nice, but use, you know, out of 10 interactions, uh, eight, nine of them featured, you know, different 
degrees of anti-Semitic attitudes, beliefs, uh, you know, implicit bias. And you can see that it, it came from a mix of uh, a hodgepodge, uh, you know, it came from the nation of Islam. It came from uh, some of the, uh, uh, this Christian anti-Semitism mutation. I, I remember, you know, growing up in Crown Heights, I would see uh, pamphlets left behind on, on uh, the subway and on uh, park benches um, from local churches. And, you know, I lift, look, look it up and I see that it's talking about Jews and deicide and, uh, you know, okay, this is what's being fed to my neighbors. Uh, there's no wonder why, you know, same thing on the subways. You you come around Crown Heights and there are often preachers who are preaching all kinds of stuff. And of course, it comes back to Jews somehow, the Jews this, the Jews that. So, uh, you know, it's coming from somewhere. There There is uh, something that we have to be, like Dove said, it has to be addressed. There is a specific type. Uh, it does. It's not because you're Black or Muslim or Asian or Jewish that you can't be a racist, that you can't be a hater. You know, uh, Jews could be racist, uh, just like Blacks could be racist, just like white people are racist. They're, you know, hate crime means that a person is using their identity as a basis to attack another person on the basis of their identity, not only to hurt that individual, but really to send a message to that entire group. Um, so in terms of, you know, I don't think it's confronting. I, I think that it's uh, raising the question because the work, as we know, it has to come internally. If this was reversed and we had a bunch of Hasidic kids, Orthodox kids who were having fun after a day of yeshiva and finding, you know, uh, other minorities to beat up at random and knock their hats off or whatever uh, as groups. Uh, what would happen? I, it wouldn't turn into a pattern because on, you know, incident three, uh, you'd have wall to wall condemnations. You'd have, you know, internally, we we deal with that a certain way. It would not be acceptable, I think, to most people. We would certainly distance. We say those people have no place uh, among us. So there would be some type of internal effort. Nobody would have to come and confront us and say, hey, you Jews, get your, your young younglings, your wayward uh, youth in line. No, no, no. But we we can ask and we should ask where is that where where is that from any all where are the responsible adults Let, let's leave the adult attackers aside uh, 25 percent are uh, teenagers uh 23 percent of the of, of the attacks of the assaults were done by groups 16 percent were done by teenagers in groups of two or more so we know there's an element there of that you know young kids put egging each other on with a sprinkling of anti-semitism you know with a little knock and a hitler should have finished the job uh, just to, to add to the level of absurdity um so that needs to be which is what you know with dove in this report and and uh, americans against anti-semitism precisely what we've been uh, and what we're still trying to do it's not about blaming it's not even about the da's or or the police or you know bail laws it's it's a lot of different things that are involved but none of it will get fixed if we can't address the most basic facts and really they're two most important facts uh, in that report relating to this question of uh, black anti-Semitism is that number one, we quantified for the first time uh, what has been known anecdotally, um, which is that in, in New York City, most assaults, not only attacks on property, which can be against, you know, uh, uh, non-Orthodox institutions, but most assaults, over 90 percent, target Orthodox Jews. Uh, so and a, a large percentage of that are Hasidic Jews. So very clearly, we have to name it, this dynamic, when we say hate crimes are skyrocketing, anti-Semitism, no, no, no. It's not affecting everybody the same way, certainly not in New York City. In New York City, when we say hate, hate crimes are skyrocketing, it means that if you're identifiably Jewish, you are experiencing a threat to your person in a way that other Jews walk around the same city and don't feel. And that disparity also, I believe, leads into the lack of response, the lack of alacrity uh, it, it, among some Jew Jewish organizations um, that, you know, certainly maybe they got they started acting later. They should have started acting sooner. Um, it's not about pointing, you know, the, the finger, because what we did was that we don't really care what the reason is. If somebody's not doing what needs to be done, you go ahead and do it. This hate crimes report, we, we you know, created this uh, hate crime accountability project for a simple reason. We were reviewing the ADL's, uh, you know, annual numbers of total incidents. And we were, okay, we're talking about it. Great. And we're trying to understand what it's telling us about anti-Semitism. You know, other than a very general, you know, pulse, a weak pulse of like uh, a little more, a little less. Do we know what kinds of, you know, who, who it's affecting? You know, just uh, 2,700 this year. Oh, it sounds bad. With a year to over year, uh, you know, 50% increase. Okay, therefore what? 
What about the the next step? What about prosecutions? How many of these people have been arrested? How many, are there consequences? If you're tracking hate crimes and you're not concerned about the full life cycle and the, and whether there are consequences, what what are you tracking? What's the purpose? And to me, as someone uh, who you know has been now with Dove involved in trying to figure something out about anti-Semitism. There's an entire complex. There's a there, there's a it's a huge pie. There's the theoretical aspect people write a lot about. You know, is it right? Is it left? Is it Islamist? Is it you know what's the the nature of it? Okay, all of that is very nice. But the one who gets hit in the face uh, from the white person, black person, from the right, the left, the the punch feels the same. I can t- I can promise you that. And the reality is, <clears throat> you know, it, the the uh, what matters most at the end of the day is calling it out and having a single standard. There needs to be a single standard. And when there's not a single standard, we enter this cycle of of perpetuation. And you can see it with uh, from Tree of Life, Pittsburgh and Poway, those attacks uh, that garnered, you know, national attention, uh, uh, you know, a very different type of uh, condemnation. And of course, people called out white supremacy. It was easy. It's hateful. It's abhorrent. It's nasty. At the end of that year, 2019, you had two back-to-back attacks, the one in Jersey City, uh, Hasidic-owned uh, uh, kosher grocery store. And in Muncie on Hanukkah, uh, uh, you know, a, a black guy went in there uh, and uh, with a machete and, and, you know, chopped a guy in the head and basically he died, a, a, you know, within a year. Um, and the other two in Jersey City were two self-subscribed black uh, Hebrew Israelites. That got almost no attention outside of New York City, no national attention. It didn't get any calls from the president. Uh, Nobody reached out. Um, Nobody really talked about it. It wasn't the same uh, uh, reaction. And that has to be looked at. We have to realize that on some level, Hasidic people, Orthodox people, if you look at the body of uh, uh, anti-Semitic visual propaganda, you will notice that for obvious reasons, maybe, uh, just to make it easy and, uh, and clear to their audience that most representations of the Jew were Orthodox, were Hasidic, were religious, even if they're not gender all religious, enough what it was enough to add uh, side curls, side locks to make their point. So you have this special animus, um, you know, uh, uh, that has accrued for Orthodox and Hasidic Jews. And in New York City, you add to the, uh, you know, when you hear people have a grievance of, about gentrification. Well, okay, let's break that down. Gentrification. Who's responsible for it? Let's leave alone that it's not a crime. It's just a, a, a part of capitalism. And to date, I haven't found a single real estate investor of any color, of any background, who says they would like to minimize their return on investment. But be that as it may, uh, who would be responsible for gentrification? Well, yeah, there are lots of Jews in real estate in New York. We know that. That's not anti-Semitic to say. There are Orthodox Jews, Hasidic Jews, Syrian Jews, uh, uh, Moroccan Jews. There are uh, uh, you know secular Jews. Reform- there are all kinds. So why is it, though, that gentrification should be, you know, blamed and carried out, punished? The punishment for it is almost uniquely directed at Hasidim and Orthodox Jews. It's not a a secular Jew who's, you know, at the end of the day, they'll say the slumlords. But who are they taking that out on? Who are they using that as a pretext to unleash unwarranted, unmitigated violence? So that becomes another important aspect. And the reality is that we have to know who it's affecting, Orthodox Jews, and that matters, the assaults. You're talking about, it's it's unique to Jews also as a victim group, because Blacks as a victim group of hate crimes, there isn't a single subset within, the you know, which is a pretty large uh, designation, Black, African American, uh, all the related, uh, 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 you know, designations, there isn't one that is disproportionately uh, being victimized physically. But within the Jewish subset, there is one group that when it comes to the physical violence outside of the terror attacks that, you know, target a, a, a synagogue, the random street level violence that's affecting one group. And it's being largely perpetrated by other minorities, each one with their own dynamics. When the, the way uh, black youth are approaching Hasidic Jews on the street is different and at different times than, say, what we saw in May 2021 when Gaza's firing rockets into Israel and, hey, globalize the Intifada. Let's go, guys, uh, from L.A., New York, London. Uh, you know, it was a free-for-all, as we saw uh, Joseph Borgen, uh, uh, you know, who uh, was uh, attacked in uh, Times Square. He was on the crutches, and they still, they took his crutches to, uh, uh, you know, to, it was another guy's crutch who uh, took 
took his crutch to beat uh, Joseph Borg and put him in the hospital. It was a very serious case. We're talking about Times Square in 2021. You got like these scenes where a Jew is running scared for his life, being chased by a swarm of, of really sick individuals looking for that, you know, for, to, to get some Jewish blood spilled. And, you know, the reaction, I don't know, was it, it, it was there to an extent. Again, the police do what they can. Uh, in that case, the DA uh, have been pursuing it. And the guy was, uh, uh, I believe it's, it's still ongoing, that, that case. So, you know, it's not even about blame and confronting the Black community. It's a matter of internally, externally saying, saying it like it is. We have data. We know the facts. It's a matter of addressing it. And we could do our part. We could bring this information to this or that community, but we can do the internal work for each community. That has to be done by them. No, th thank you very much. You know, yeah, we, we sort of come to it in a very similar way, you know, talking about, and I think we did this at the protests, you know, together with uh, um, Dove talking about how uh, Black community leaders must get involved in this and, you know, and, and really clamp down and set an example and, you know, talk about how unacceptable the Jew, Jew hatred and Jew attacks on Jews are. And um, also the police, I know, you know, we protested about uh, the lack of, you know, adequate police protection and, you know, you need to have plain clothes people dressed as Hasidim and so on, you know, out there so that they can, you know, somebody attacks somebody who looks Jewish, you know, they can, uh, you know, arrest them right away, you know, that, that sort of thing. There, there are a lot of steps and, you know, and which are ones that we've all, you know, been pushing for, you know, to get, you know, the ZOA and, and Americans Against Anti-Semitism. Um, we have quite a few questions. So, um, oh, actually two of the people dropped off, I'm sorry, who were asking questions, but, you know, so I wanted to ask you to keep the answers short so we can try to get to, you know, get to uh, various people's questions. Um, Greta Rafsky, um, please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Greta, are you there? Greta? Greta? Hello? Liz, I, I think that um, uh, you have to ask the question. I don't think we have the... Oh, no, she has her hand raised. She wanted to ask her question live, um, which we usually do. Um, Steve, uh, let's see, Steve Feldman. Um, Steve, are you? Can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you, thank you, Liz, uh, and thank you to uh, Dove and Israel. Interesting discussion. I have a question related to the term anti-Semitism itself, which, of course, is in the title of your book. Uh, there's a there's a movement to to retire that that phrase, uh, which I happen to be a proponent of, um, replaced with Jew hatred, anti-Jewish. Uh, I'm not aware of any Jewish person who's ever called him or herself a Semite. The Arabs have co-opted the term saying uh, they can't be accused of anti-Semitism because they too are Semites. What are your thoughts uh, about retiring that, that phrase? I can tell you that uh, I, I, in almost every situation, prefer talking about Jew hatred because that's exactly what it is and it gets right to the point. So I'm totally with you. As you know, the, the term anti-Semitism is a relatively new one. It was always Jew hatred. So I would prefer that. Uh, how do we make that happen? I mean, is it going to happen? I'm not sure. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, anti-Semitism, Jew hatred, I prefer Jew hatred. But, uh, you know, whatever term is used, we all get it. We all understand. And, uh, but I'm definitely with you on that. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it, it can definitely, obviously, unfortunately, lends itself to being uh, uh, obfuscated, you know, twisted. Oh, a Semite. Well, we're Semites. Also, how could we be anti-Semites? OK, leaving that aside, the fact is that it's been popularized. So uh, certainly as a subject, as a for a title, um, you got to get to the point. It, it's not wasn't the location to make that point and say, hey, it's time to change. Internally, it is discussed. It's, a, this, you know, uh, Deborah Lipstadt. Um, raises that point very well and explains why, um, you know, Jew hatred, why, especially why anti-Semitism is not hyphenated, because there is no Semite and Semitism, it's anti-Semitism. Um, so in this book, it's used. And at the end of the day, in writing about it, you can't just also say Jew hatred, Jew hatred 20 you know, times. Um, so I, I do go back and forth uh, between the two. Um, and usually, specifically, the real important distinction is between earlier anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism, racialized, 
um, you know, the the more modern manifestations that 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 we're uh, familiar with. So I, I think that over time, uh, yeah, we, we probably will see Jews certainly in this space using Jew hatred when we're bottom line talking about it. That's what it is. But as a term, certainly uh, academically, uh, it's probably still going to have currency for a while. Thanks. Thank, th thank you very much. Um, I'm going to read a couple. I'm going to read yeah. now. It's Greta. I didn't have. Oh, Greta. The, oh, hi, Greta. Hi. Great, yeah. great. On my phone, it wasn't showing up. Thank you very much for calling on me. Um, yes, I would like to ask if in this book you have um, drawn the connection between the Mufti of Jerusalem and his friendship with Hitler. I think this is a part of history that so few people know about. And he encouraged the um, the the visual anti-Semitism throughout the Arab lands using a lot of Goebbels' um, uh, visual uh, anti-Semitic pictures. Is that something that's included that you explain in your book, Israel? Yep. Yeah, so the chapter on uh, the Islamic version of anti-Semitism. Actually, I will just show you so you can see what the uh, opening artwork is, is basically the East to West connection of Nazism to uh, radical Islamism of the of the Mufti. And the very first uh, page of the chapter deals with uh, that infamous 1941 meeting uh, in Berlin. Um, so that that is absolutely, you know, central to understanding uh, a lot about, you know, this was not about Zionists came, they saw people there they didn't see, they they bulldozed the place. And, you know, it, it's actually twisted when you look at the facts and like, you know, Jews brought prosperity, the average life expectancy went up uh, uh, on it, by every measure for the you know, the maximum number of people and that at every turn you could see that, uh, the, you know, the way Palestinians spoke about their own people. Uh, Musa Alami told uh, uh, Ben Gurion that he doesn't care if it takes another hundred years uh, for the Palestinians to, uh, you know, become prosperous as long as it's uh, not with the Jews here. So, you know, that's what we were uh, uh, dealing with at the time. But yes, to answer your question, it's certainly in there. It figures prominently, as you can see. Okay, I'm going to read. I'm going thank to read you. so much. Oh, thank you so much, Greg. I'm going to read. I guess two questions. One is from David Jacobs. Well, he's asking whether you will be translating the book into Hebrew and will it be available on a website. Um, in addition, um, let's see, Steve. Uh, oh, well, let's see, Steve Gerzoff, um is asking. Uh, quote. Uh, could we have uh, dis more discussion about the origins of Jew hatred in the foundational texts of Islam? The amount of Jew hatred throughout the Quran is, uh, to the average American, absolutely unbelievable. We need more exposure and direct quotes from the Quran. Um, that's a question from Steve Gerza. Well, I'll do the easy part as far as translating <laughs> into other languages. Uh, you know, first, let's deal with the English version and get it out and make it a bestseller throughout the country. And uh, it is doing very well, but there's a lot of work to do. So let's get that done. And we'll be one of the uh, organizations that we, we've we worked very close with and supported the book uh, financially and so on is the uh, WZO, the World Zionist Organization. So uh, when they saw the book at even an early stage, they were incredibly excited. They said, we want to be part of this. So uh, in due time, we will discuss with them uh, bringing it to other people. I'd like to see a French version. Uh, I, I think it's important for people all over the world to, to be able to see what has been created here, uh, uh, you know, in all languages. But first, let's get the English version out there in a big way. Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, if, if you directed your request uh, to, you know, uh, the pu the publisher or the or an Israeli bookseller, then you know over time uh, they'll they'll have enough um, you know demand uh, to to undertake that. So yeah, I, I would love to see it uh, translated. Um, to answer the other question, uh, right after dealing with the connection between the Mufti and uh, Hitler, we in the book we go back to the beginning, the origins of uh, Islam again to understand how its uh, uh, genesis really. Uh, what, what its dynamic, its relationship was with Judaism at the time and Jews um, and how that affected, you know, Islamic uh, Muslim theology. Um, and 
you know, dealing with the text. I, I do not get into the Quran and offer tons of quotes to, uh, uh, you know, do a, a, a literary analysis of uh, the Quran that that would be uh, beyond the point for this book, which you have to realize is the main point is if someone would read it from beginning to end, which has a purpose, because especially when dealing with the Israeli history, because a lot of it is taken as, you know, from this vantage point, looking back, like, how did we end up with an occupation? How did we end up with, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah? Well, you got to go back and then each step forward, understand how, what that progression led to. Um, you know, so it's really a matter of understanding key dynamics about the Quran, namely that uh, it's a bit, it has a duality that is, uh, scholars believe is uh, attached to the earlier and later, uh, you know, years of uh, Muhammad, the beginning when he had hopes that Jews would, uh, uh, you know, accept him, and uh, to the later years where he was uh, uh, conquering, killing, converting uh, uh, Jews uh, in larger numbers. Uh, so you have those reflected there, but also deal with the fact that there's the Hadith, and that's where uh, really a lot of the worst stuff uh, said about Jews um, you know, exists. And, and that has to be known. We have to understand that, you know, Jews don't have a body of work where we describe Christians or Muslims as descending from apes and pigs. But this is a document uh, that has different uh, authoritative uh, value, depending on your on which sect or, or uh, you know, school of Islamic jurisprudence you follow. But uh, the point being that um, it, it is absolutely uh, important to understanding the progression, to understanding how uh, Christian anti-Semitism, Muslim anti-Semitism developed with uh, similar patterns, some key differences, and then how in the modern era, thanks largely at the beginning to imperialism, um, and where those contacts, European powers, uh, you know, dominating suddenly, uh, you know, these uh, Muslim and Arab uh, uh, powers, uh, what that created, where they also imported the blood libels in the 19th century, where you start seeing, you know, dozens and dozens of blood libels throughout North Africa, the Middle East, uh, you know, the Mediterranean basin, all around the Ottoman Empire um, and beyond. Uh, so all of that, of course, converges. There's no way to understand that without going back to you know, the very creation of Islam, even understanding, I get into it here, uh, understanding the nuance of, uh, you know, Jerusalem and Mecca, how, you know, Jerusalem was the, the spot. And then, again, based on Muhammad's, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, two-part uh, experience of, uh, you know, good with the Jews and then, uh, you know, bad with the Jews. So, turn to Mecca, when Umar, the Caliph Umar, conquered Jerusalem, he had a choice when they were setting the uh, uh, foundations for Al-Aqsa, the mosque, uh, they could have either put it to the north side of the Temple Mount, which would have meant that if you were facing the Mecca from Jerusalem, you would be facing both the Temple Mount, Jerusalem, and Mecca. You get two for one. What they did was the opposite. They put it on the south side. So it would be very clear that if you're a, a Muslim, you, even at the center, right in Jerusalem, you give your back to the Temple Mount and you look forward uh, to Mecca. So all of these things, when they say, oh, you know, it's the third holiest site in Islam and, you know, okay. we're trying somehow to do the worst thing. Like, we don't have a history of raising mosques and building synagogues on top of them or or, or churches. But that is the Jewish experience for, you know, some uh, 1,500, 2,000 years. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. That That is something that is dealt with uh, in depth because it, it's, uh, it's a vital component. It's important, definitely. Um, I'm, I have two interesting uh, theological questions here, um, one from Adam Novak and one from Peter Friedman, which I'll read. Um, Peter Friedman asks, um, was Jew hatred built into God's creation for the reason of keeping us separate from others, unique to and reliant on God? Uh, because like uh, other natural rules that govern creation, it seems inherent in creation, having been present since Amalek, Egypt till today. And Adam Novak asks, um, Israel, wow, thanks for speaking about the history coming from Christianity. After reading James Carroll's book, Constantine's Sword, I was saddened to more for fully realize how much Christianity has pounded into the human psyche that Jews are evil. Now, when I see different popular figures, Kanye West, et cetera, recycle the concept that Jews are the children of the devil, I realize the deep theological roots to the belief. Do you think Christians have done enough to publicly take responsibility uh, that the children of the devil slander came originally and is still codified as the word of God in, Christ, in the Christian New Testament. And I want to just add one other thing that I was thinking about on this, which is, um, uh, I don't think, I don't think he went into this, but uh, Constantine had a nephew um, 
Julian, the, uh, they call him Julian the apostate or Julian the Hellene, um, who was a pagan and, and rejected Christianity. And he was very good to the Jews. Um, and in fact, allowed Jews to go back to, um, to, to start rebuilding a third temple. Um, and unfortunately, he died two years later. And then uh, constant, <clears throat> the Christians, the Byzantines came in and destroyed, you know, the foundations of that. Um, but uh, does, um, you know, does that say anything about the pagan world versus the Christian world vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, um, you know, attitudes towards Jews? and various respites from, from uh, anti-Semitism. I'd like to uh, deal with the second question. Uh, I'll let Israel deal with the first one. Uh, in terms of the, uh, with the Christianity has dealt with the anti-Semitism historically. And the answer is absolutely not. Uh, when one studies uh, David Nirenberg, Anti-Judaism and other books uh, similar, uh, the history of the Catholic Church, not 2,000 years ago alone, or 1,000 years ago, but throughout history, up until very recent times and even now, it is a shameful, shameful history of Jew hatred. You know, there are many who feel and believe that Adolf Hitler was helped along by the teaching of the Catholic Church. In fact, I remember you know, reading a book about, uh, uh, you know, the Vatican, the Pope at that time, uh, I think it was Pius XII during the Holocaust, you know, where, where the representatives of Nazi Germany to the Catholic Church at that time actually told the Catholic Church, look, we're doing what you guys have been talking about all of these years. We're following the things that you said about the Jews, all the evil, all the horrible things. And if you study carefully that history, going back to the period of the apostles, I mean, it is really, you know, after looking at it very, very closely, I finally understand it's part of the DNA. It's the DNA of society. Hatred of Jews by the greatest, not just people from the, from the Catholic Church, popes throughout history, including recent times. Uh, philosophers, some of the greatest thinkers of, of, of history that when we study in school, we admire these great individuals, philosophers, and so on. When it came to Jews, they hated Jews, and they repeated the things that the Catholic Church said about Jews throughout history. It is a sad, horrible, horrible history in terms of the Catholic Church. Uh, you know, we, again, as I said, there's so much to talk about in terms of that. And, you know, Professor Goldhagen deals with that in great, great detail. It is, I got to tell you, as much as I knew, the more I read about the Catholic Church, the more depressing it gets and, and sort of understand why we are where we are today. Uh, you know, I mean, the history of the Catholic Church is a very, very sad one. They are so much responsible for the grief, for the, for the terrible things that have happened to the Jewish people, men, women, and children being slaughtered throughout history. Thank the Catholic Church. Yep. Well, I would also add that, you know, they're, they're still like another side and and the other side being that, you know, if we're here in America now and, and we're having this conversation, uh, it's because Christianity has in, in many ways come a long way. Uh, work has been done. Uh, it's not the same, you know, in America, we don't feel the Catholic church um, the way, you know, Jews did for centuries uh, in Europe. Um, you know, we have to realize that the uh, Protestant Reformation uh, not only set off a, a chain reaction that that ended with, uh, uh, you know, the, the breaking apart of church and state, um, but this, you know, universal tolerance as as two faced and, and uh, disingenuous as it has been at many times. Uh, at the end of the day, nobody can compare, uh, you know, Jewish life, even in modern Europe post war, -war today versus you know, medieval Europe, it's not to compare. France today, 
uh, is it's a it's not a great situation for Jews. You have to pretty much hide your Judaism or just know that you're walking with a target on your back, but it still can be compared. Uh, you know, you don't have the Catholic Church and the local priests agitating to, uh, you know, get the local Jew thrown into prison and then, you know, stir up a, a you know, blood libel pogrom. Uh, you know, these things are, are not happening uh, in the same way now at the same time. It's a massive world. We said there are two billion, uh, uh, you know, people who identify as, as Christian, one sort or another, um, who hold, you know, ideologies. Some of them are just attitudes. Some of, you know, are things that they've heard. Um, so I, we also have to be careful. I think, uh, especially in the fight against, in, in anti-Semitism, is, uh, and also with, you know, celebrities, people. Who, it's the same standard for everyone. You know, somebody says something, and it's like, oh, that's anti-Semitic. That you give them a chance. It's like. You either you can walk off the ledge or you can walk back. You know, the person that doubles doubles down and walks off the ledge. Well, you're a committed anti-Semite. Enjoy. You know, uh, the ones that walk back, we don't have to, you know, treat them like, uh, 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 you know, uh, diabolical Jew haters uh, that, that have that deep inside them. That that ends up just being something that is uh, uh, an attitude. So. We have to separate that today, even in, in among Christians, we, you know, there are a lot of books that deal with the Christian responsibility by Christians, written by Christians uh, in dealing with the Christian role during the Holocaust, uh, in dealing with the Crusades, in dealing with uh, the entire medieval period and the uh, uh, church, in, you know, led and, and fueled and motivated and incited pogroms. Um, so a lot of work has been done and there are a lot of uh, Christians out there. And I don't just mean the work. Um, you know, uh, uh, kumbaya, intercommunal, let's have interfaith, uh, you know, uh, 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 round table picture and, and everyone will feel good about each other. But there are issues that need to be solved that go back to what we discussed earlier at the outset. You have to correct something fundamentally in the foundations of Christianity and how you and as a Christian, how the Christian would understand its early relationship to Judaism. The rewiring needs to happen on their end, not ours. Our, you know, our narrative didn't change. Uh, we don't have a, a need. There's no article of faith to hate Christians. Uh, you know, it's never been promoted. There have been some things that are said in the Talmud that they've used over the years to burn the Talmud and claim that, you know, uh, it's anti-Christian, which is absolutely not true. There's no halacha. There's no article of faith that says, as a good Jew, you need to hate. You need to believe, you know, that the Christian soul is, is not going to go to, uh, you know, to heaven. This is an important point, ironically, is that Jews are blamed for chosenness and as if it's being supreme. And Yet, because of endogamy, marrying only, you know, within, it stayed a small uh, population. Christianity explodes into uh, something much bigger, but at the same time, uh, you know, Jews say that to be chosen, you don't need to be Jewish. You just need to be a good, decent human being, according to the Noahide laws. Like, don't rip, you know, legs off an animal and eat it. That should be pretty basic. Even today, it's still done. Uh, so it's it's obviously not that basic, but that's what it means. You don't have to be a Jew. You don't have to be a Jew to get accepted into heaven or to be worthy of redemption. But alternatively, the, the group that said, hey, we're coming totally from love, loved us to death. OK, you, you know, uh, no, there's no other choice. You have to be Christian, uh, not only to get to heaven, but to live. So that idea, um, you know, is still something that needs to be worked on by theologians, by Christians. And it is being worked on. So uh, I, I agree with Dove that in the big scheme, no, we cannot say that after thousands of years of institutionalized uh, persecution and indoctrinating the masses, like Dove says, it's it, it's essentially in the DNA, it's in the fabric of society, it's interwoven there at this stage, so that you can't grow up in the West uh, or in the East these days either, um, and not pick up, you know, the Jew jokes, don't Jew me down, oh, oh, I didn't realize it's wrong to say that, because, you know, they... They just thought, or, you know, Jews control the banks. They thought it was a compliment. Um, so the bottom line is that uh, there's a lot more of that work to be done, but we shouldn't also dismiss because there are people out there who are like, they spend their time doing that. And on, because on the scheme, it's, it's still relatively small and it doesn't undo, you know, millions of people who've been murdered in cold blood. Uh, you know, they, the, the uh, church uh, uh, issued, a, a, you know, an updated uh, bull to it uh, on its... Uh, on deicide, uh, absolving the Jews, saying it's wrong, right? They gave they, they they made an official policy that the Jews are not responsible for deicide. Did they apologize at the same time for spilling all the blood for two thousand years, based on what again 
is written in the New Testament, the blood will be on you, right? So it's this, this idea that Jews are perpetually guilty and perpetually worthy of punishment, which if, if we see is the case, and I see there's a question here about Kanye West and how that comes in, you know, these Christian ideas cycle in. Well, the idea of perpetual guilt, that is the perfect uh, basis, ingredient to make Jews walking down the street random targets because they're guilty anyway for things they did in the past for things they're probably doing now and it's punishment uh, that you know if he didn't deserve it well his people do anyway and one of the things we hear often in response is well you know the, the jews they all take care of each other so he'll be all right the one who got hit in the face it's like it, it's no big deal so of, of course today we have a cesspool all of these intersecting nasty ideas. There's basically a, a super virus, 2000 years of mutating in isolation. And then the internet brings it all together and you have an anti-Semitism super virus that you could not have imagined uh, in 1940, 1941, even in 1945, that there would arise a black celebrity who would say he's in love with Hitler and loves everything about Hitler. It doesn't make any sense, but here we are. All right. Th th thank you so much. Um... I, let me also mention that uh, two weeks from today, we are having a book club with uh, uh, you know, the wonderful Caroline Glick, Caroline Glick um, discussing her book, uh, Shackle Warrior. I think that uh, Jackie put the uh, sign up information into the um, into the chat. Um, if anybody would like to sign up now or, you know, we'll also be sending out the information. I hope, uh, hope to see everybody there also. We wanted to make sure to mention that before people signed off. I, I wanted to really thank uh Dove and Israel for spending so much time discussing this important book and again for for producing this important book and um I uh I, I know you didn't get to uh you know to the to the other part of the to the other uh part of the theological questions that were asked of you but there was so we, much that we could discuss we need to get a rabbi and, for that we could we could go we could go <laughs> on and on and on I guess this, this is such an important topic and for anybody whose question we didn't get to I I apologize but uh, you know this is we've gone way over time and I want to thank you for spending so much time with us and also to see if uh, you have maybe a one minute summation that uh, Israel and, and Dove would like to make um, before we all sign off. And again, I wanna wish everybody a very, very happy new year, very happy secular new year that's healthy and everybody stays healthy and well. Uh, take a minute. Uh, first of all, thanks for the opportunity, Liz, uh, to be with you and okay. COA at the book club. And uh, I would just urge everyone, uh, everyone needs to be involved. Everyone needs to play a role, whatever role that is. Uh, sometimes we face problems and we, we say to ourselves, what difference can I make? I mean, the problem is so huge, so out of control. Is it really going to make a difference, whatever I do? Well, the answer is yes, you need to be involved. You know, the responsibility uh, is for us to do whatever we can. The rest we leave in God's hands. And that's what I believe. We are faced with very difficult times right now. We need to be involved in whatever way we can support those that are out there in the front lines. Oh, yeah, let, let me make one other announcement, which was also in the chat that um, later this month, Mort Klein will be discussing the whole issue of um, anti-Semitism and the, and the relations with Jews and Blacks. Um, together with um, Dumisani uh, Washington from the Institute of, which who is from the Institute of Black Solidarity with Israel, um, so that should be uh, uh, an excellent program that will be on uh, at Florida University, um, and I hope we'll get tapes of that so that we can share that with everybody also. Um, and you know, I I did also want to mention that you know there's so many differences among Christian groups. The evangelicals have been great friends to Israel and the Jewish people. On the other hand, you have groups like the Quakers who are responsible for a lot of the BDS today. Um, in fact, you know, when I was uh, when, when we wrote to the government about the mapping project, the BDS mapping project, we traced that back to information. Uh, put together by the Quakers as to um, who to boycott, you know, who, which, you know, how to boycott Jews and so on. So there, there is a tremendous variation in, you know, in the different groups. 
anyway, um, uh, Israel, you know, if you, uh, if, I'd yeah. love to hear your uh, summation. And again, sure. happy new year to everybody. Yes, thank you again. Like uh, Dove said, thank you for uh, arranging this and uh, giving us the time and uh, really the opportunity to uh, uh, speak in depth and to engage on uh, this important subject. I do want to say that, you know, for all the uh, questions left unanswered. Uh, anyone can reach out on social media, any social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, and I'll you know do my best to be responsive. Or you can email me, uh, Israel at AmericansAA.org. That's Americans, uh, plural, AA.org. And uh, I'll be happy to, uh, to respond. Um, you know, like Dove said, again, the, do your part. What I would add and say is that we have to stop being so surprised by each little manifestation like, oh, man, I can't believe they said this. I can't believe they would go that far. It's like read the book, you know, see that you should stop being shocked because for 2000 years, it's the same stupid. You know, they're not very creative. They just repackage. It's like a bad, uh, you know, uh, regifting. Uh, you know, th th that's how we, we ought to feel. Um, and the point is that knowing that, you know, the point of this book was not to create debaters. It was not so that, oh, okay, you take this, you go out there. It was to simply fortify your average Jew, your young Jew internally, so that you know, you know, you have history on your side that, you know, these pogroms and anti-Semitism, it may bring us down in the moment. In the big picture, it does not bring us down because we have persevered. And that's a more, you know, uh, uh, beautiful story than is ugly, uh, the history of anti-Semitism. So the bottom line, especially if you live in a place like New York City uh, or, or where you have high visibility as a Jew, protect yourself in one way or another, whatever means works for you as an individual. Um, you know, if it, you believe in spiritual protection, go for it. If you believe in physical, you're, you're adept with uh, weapons or not, I, I mean it. I mean that a Jew has to expect that you may be faced with this, so you don't want to wait till the last minute. This is a reality now. Synagogues know it. There's no more, well, we'll leave the door open. We'll see what happens. It, you know, you have to take those precautions uh, because better safe than sorry. So it's sor merava setov. The minimum is that we have to protect ourselves, uh, you know, not be scared, not be worried. And then from there, do that. Uh, positive work, the outreach, intercommunal, interfaith, building those relations, relationships, building the bridges and having dialogue. I think it's important to have that into what you're going to have with uh, uh, Mort Klein and uh, Dumasani Washington, uh, who I, I followed. I think both are great. Um, and that's an important conversation uh, to be having. I think it's also important to be having that conversation at the ground, you know, local level, if you're dealing with Crown Heights, Williamsburg, it needs to be residents from those areas, Jewish and non-Jewish, who are starting to take accountability for what's happening on the ground. And the bottom line is, as cliche as it sounds, if you see something, say something, and don't politicize anti-Semitism. The politicization of anti-Semitism means that anytime something happens, half of you know the population is not going to respond because it's inconvenient. So we have to make sure that we're not reinforcing that and whether it's a Republican, a Democrat, uh, someone we know, someone we don't know. And again, they don't have not, we don't have to cancel everybody. We don't have to call for their heads. Uh, but if someone is willing to step back from the ledge, great, no problem. Uh, they want to step off the ledge, we'll help them forward. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dove. Thank you, Israel. Thank you, everybody. Happy New Year. <laughs>